Uh, we will be talking about some uh, violence, and we've got some videotapes of people talking about their injuries, as well as uh, violence against police officers. So I'm um, just giving you that warning up front. It's not too graphic, but if it makes you uncomfortable, um, feel free to step out. My career path has resembled a country road, and it's been very crooked and very, at times, unexpected. And to, to highlight this point, I'd like to start off by talking about a person who's very in influential in my life. Suki is my cousin's daughter. My, my cousin's daughter, wow. Let me start over. Suki is my wife's cousin, and she's just a remarkable human being. And she's intellectually very, very gifted. She's the only child of two high school teachers. She chose to go to Yale on a full scholarship. After graduating from Yale, she decided that she wanted a PhD in clinical psychology. So she applied to multiple doctoral programs. She had a 4.0 from Yale, and she had perfect scores on the graduate record exam, quantitative and verbal. Perfect scores. So she chose to go to UCLA. Completing her PhD, she kind of made a difficult decision at this point in her life and said, really, my passion is pediatrics. So although she had a PhD, Suki applied to one and only one medical program, one of the finest in the world, and she stayed at UCLA. On the very first day of her final rotation, Suki was driving home and she was hit head-on and killed by a drunk driver. She left behind a husband, a three-year-old daughter, and a three-month-old daughter. At her funeral, I learned that Suki's research for her doctoral dissertation was impactful research. She had gone and studied resilience among inner-city youth and recommended ways to bolster resiliency. As a young assistant professor, my research, it was important in its own light, but it really didn't make an impact in people's lives. And so inspired by the life and the work of Suki, I too decided to change uh, my research agenda to follow my passion. And that's how I became involved in violence prevention research. In May of 2012, May 5th, Officer Shannon Loudon with the West Virginia State Patrol Crimes Against Children Unit was interviewing a suspect. And the suspect admitted to some things that he had done and stated that he had a camera at his ex-wife's house that had some pictures on it. So Shannon accompanied this person to the ex-wife's house to retrieve the camera as evidence. Seizing upon a momentary lapse in Shannon's uh, attention, the offender bolted into an adjoining bedroom. Officer Loudon believed that the offender was going in there to get and destroy the camera, so he gave chase. And when he got in, the offender was crouched behind the bed. Shannon ordered him up, and when he stood up, he didn't have a camera in his hand. He had a gun, and he walked right up, and he stuck it on Shannon's chest and pulled the trigger. Knowing that he needed to get outside so he could get to his cruiser and call for backup, Shannon started running. As he was crossing the living room floor, the offender came around the corner and put another bullet between his shoulder blades. Officer Loudon received life-threatening injuries, and he was airlifted to Ruby Memorial Hospital at West Virginia University. The FBI defines ambushes as one of two types. There's a planned ambush in which one or more people plan in advance to shoot and potentially kill a law enforcement officer. They often use subterfuge to bring this person to them, such as a, a fake 911 call. The other type is termed an unprovoked attack. And in that situation, an offender seizes upon an opportunity to, to attack without warning usually motivated to escape. 
How many of you knew that the largest FBI center outside of the Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia area is housed in West Virginia? It's located just outside of Clarksburg. And in the 500,000 square foot main building, it houses the Criminal Justice Information Services Division, or CJIS. Within CJIS is a very small unit of just a few people. Law enforcement officers killed and assaulted, or LEOCA. Outside of the Behavioral Science Unit, which has now been renamed the Behavioral Research and Instruction Unit, LEOCA is the only unit within the FBI that's charged with conducting research. Their first study was published in 1992, and this was killed in the line of duty. It was a study of um, felonious killings of police officers. They followed that up in 1997 with In the Line of Fire, Violence Against Law Enforcement. So they were look, looking at this time at just fel felonious assaults against officers. And then in 2006, their largest, largest study to date was published. I have to click it twice. Violent Encounters, a study of felonious assaults on our nation's law enforcement officers. The cornerstone to the research that LEOCA conducts is that they translate their research to training. So the members of LEOCA are classified as training instructors through the FBI, and they spend many, many months of the year traveling through the, throughout the United States training police officers based upon what they found in their research. To date, since their first 1992 publication, they have trained over 76,000 police officers from almost 25,000 separate police agencies. In 2002, I was, was just wrapping up a study with the Behavioral Science Unit of the FBI on hostage takers' motives and tactics. And as this study was winding down, the people at the Behavioral Science Unit int introduced me to the people at LEOCA. LEOCA was beginning a new project, and they were looking for an academic partner who could help them analyze the massive data that they would be getting and make sense of it. It was a perfect partnership. I already had my background clearance. We already had an MOU in place with the FBI, and location-wise, it was perfect. We're about, depending on who's driving, we're about a 40-minute drive from WVU. Ambushes and unprovoked attacks, assaults on our nation's law enforcement officers, is the study that they were developing at the time. It is the only study of its kind in the world. They have gone in and they have interviewed 32 law enforcement officers, 22 of whom were the victim officers. They survived an ambush. 10 were witness officers. These may have been the um, victim officer's partner, or they may have been another officer who officer who arrived on scene as a backup. In addition, they've gone to prisons all throughout the United States and they've interviewed 26 offenders. All of the offenders were charged and found guilty of murder or attempted murder of one or more officers. In addition, each person who participated in this research signed an informed consent form and they signed a release form so that the FBI could use their data and their images in their future trainings. Before I get into what we've done and what we've found, I'd like to throw a few uh, acknowledgments out there. First, thank you to West Virginia University. The people there have been incredibly supportive of the research that I've been doing since I arrived in 2008. I'd like to especially thank my dean, Gypsy Denzine, for her wonderful support of all that I've done and continue to do. I would like to thank my colleagues in the Department of Counseling, Rehabilitation Counseling, and Counseling Psychology who are tolerant of the time that I put into this research. And especially I'd like to thank my wife, Susan, who is truly the love of my life and to me the model of all that is good and right with the world. So thank you for your support. Finally, I need to acknowledge the members of LEOCA. Now, people who are in the FBI also tend to get nicknames. So I would like to specifically thank Jimmy the Beast Sheets. If you saw him, you would agree that he is the beast. He has no neck. The man is a monster. He was one of these strongman competitors where they pull trains and stuff, whatever they do. 
Um, Roger Miller, Roger was the unit leader, so he doesn't get a nickname because they can't give him one. Missy Blake, who's been around so long that she, she's earned not having a nickname. Brian Diamond McAllister. And if you'd like to know how he came up with, or how they came up with Diamond for him, talk to me afterwards. It's a sh fairly long story. And then Phil the Tree Wright. Tall guy. These people are dedicated to a level that I've rarely seen in my life. They are doing work that saves lives. Not that will save lives, but that saves lives. And their passion for this research is infectious. It's been a true honor to work with them. Over the past three years since I began working with Leoka, I have to say that I've also worked with some of the brightest, most dedicated individuals I've ever encountered. To date, 15 students in our PhD program in counseling psychology have volunteered their time to go through transcript after transcript, and these are thick transcripts of these interviews, trying to pull out important data. They put in hours every single week. Every week we have team meetings that start at 7.30 a.m., and they are always there. When a new student expresses interest in the project, I start with several weeks of training. And in that time, I have them read the first three books that Leoka has published. I then have them read articles that describe the methodology that we use. They also have to sign a non-disclosure form with the FBI that basically says if you disclose information, you'll disappear. Um, not really. And then they also have to sign on to the FBI's Institutional Review Board so that they're cleared to be able to work on this research. Driving home the point of their level of dedication. A couple years ago, one of the students, um, there, there was a new in, incoming group of students, and the Leoka team came up to West Virginia University to give a training for their uh, police force. The trainings involve uh, multiple videos of offenders and officers talking, as well as information that the FBI has gleaned from this uh, research that they've done. One police officer was describing the extent of her injuries when she was beaten nearly to death. And I say that in all, seriously, in all seriousness. She was almost dead when backup arrived. One of my students got up and left the room. I later found out that she had gone into the bathroom and vomited. Yet the amazing piece is that she has been with this research team now for three years. That is dedication that I see on a daily basis in my students. And I cannot thank them enough. As we've done our research, we go through these transcripts and we come out with different themes and different codes. It's qualitative research. I actually have our code books. This is the code book for the police officers. And this is the code book for our offenders. If anybody's interested in looking at these, I'd be happy to pass them around. Um, if you're not interested, just pass them by. One of the things that we found when we've studied the offenders in this research is that every one of them has had a life of adversity. When we look at things like um, family environment growing up, 73% came from, family, from, from unstable families. Single parent homes, divorce, crime, drugs, these sorts of things were happening in their families. 77% reported a prior history of substance abuse. And often this is polysubstance abuse. They're using multiple types of drugs and alcohol. 88% report prior criminal involvement. And these are the crimes for which they'd been arrested. We tell them during the interview that if they tell us about a crime for which they've not been arrested, we need to report that. So this is something that is only known as 88% prior criminal involvement. And the crimes are violent crimes. We're seeing people who have been convicted of rape, murder, um, assault, robbery, theft. Many of the offenders that we see have different ways of looking at the world and di different ways of viewing the world than hopefully you and I do. 
the person that I'm about to show you is a, an individual who uh, is sen serving a life sentence. It was nearing 4th of July, and they wanted some fireworks, he and two friends. Rather than going down and purchasing the fireworks, they hatched a wonderfully brilliant idea. They stole a truck. They backed the truck through the front of a gun store. They stole as many guns as they possibly could, and they stole the fireworks, and then they took off. About 2 o'clock in the morning, they pulled into a park way out in the country where they had left their car. And they were in the process of moving the guns from the truck to the car when a police officer arrived. Uh oh. That didn't work. I didn't know at the time it was a cop. Ah, oh, sorry. This has worked every single time. I figured it out when he started moving the, um, the light around on underneath, the, underneath the truck as he's walking around. Let me see if I can get that to play right. I am sorry. This, this should have started. I didn't know at the time it was a cop. Um, I kind of figured it out when he started moving the, um, the light around on underneath, the, underneath the truck as he's walking around. Because when he came in, we, you know, we were ducked down. Did you notice that he looked down at the table through the entire interview except at one point? He looked up when he said the other guy shot him three times in the face. The reason he looked up at that point is because he's lying to us. We know that what, he, what happened in that situation is he was the leader and he ordered one of the other guys to shoot him. So that was on his orders that the officer was shot again. What he's also not telling you is that after he emptied his clip, after he ran over the officer's body, and it was evident that he had been dead at that point, he threw the car in reverse and ran over a second time before he then told his uh, friend to shoot him again. You may recognize this individual. He recently escaped from a maximum security prison in upstate New York with another individual. Right after he was uh, after he escaped, I was contacted by the FBI. The people who were working it knew that I had this interview transcript that we had studied, and they wanted to know any insights that I could add. I said, given his level of brutality, given the extent of the overkill in this situation, and given the lack of remorse, this man fits the definition or the pattern of a dangerous psychopath. He has no remorse, and his freedom is worth any price that he can uh, meet out f to maintain that freedom. The officers that we've interviewed 
have had incredible experiences in their lives. Hopefully, their experiences don't mirror the types of things that happen to us in our world. Most of us will probably be never ambushed, will probably never be shot, sometimes multiple times. Hopefully, we'll never see the gunning down of a partner. Yet each of these officers has lived that. The officers in our research talked about their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors surrounding the ambush. They talked about what was happening immediately prior to and during the ambush. They also talked about the recovery afterwards. The officer that you're about to see was called in as a backup. Another officer made a routine drunk driving stop. The driver had pulled up in front of his house. So this officer came to back up and felt that everything had gone well. As the other officer was taking the driver away, this officer pulled around the block. It was at night. She was going to pull around the block and do her paperwork. As she pulled around the block, she saw a figure standing in the parking lot. Well, unbeknownst to her, the driver's adult son had run into the house to retrieve a gun. I also have to apologize on this one. I could not get the, the audio and the video to match up. It's about a two second differential, so it can be really annoying watching because she's not saying what she's saying. But uh, if it's too confusing, just close your eyes and listen. And it's going to do the same thing again. OK. Technology. Let me try going back and seeing if I can re-enter. So, uh, before I have the chance. I don't know what happened. It worked great last hour. Um, oh. Okay, close your eyes because now I'm completely at the start of the Prezi. Uh, so just to review, <laughs> Leoka, they've done research. I work with great people. We've interviewed some offenders. I didn't know at the time. He didn't know at the time. And we've interviewed officers. So my car door and get out. He turns on me and I just see a long barrel. Just close your eyes and listen. Don't really have a description of him. I can just see dark clothing. He looks a little taller. Um, puts long, has a long barrel to his face automatically. He starts firing, so I realize it's a gun. Um, right off. Uh, I remember hearing the first one or two shots and then the sound of his gun went away. Um, as I said earlier, uh, it was initially that I felt like I just froze kind of in that startled like, is this really happening reaction? Um, then I immediately went into thinking I need to get my gun out. I was also, at the time, I didn't know what type of gun he was firing. Uh, so I didn't realize the rounds were coming through my car. So my thought was I need to get my head out of the window. Um, so one of the rounds doesn't take my head off. We have an armrest in our car, so I kind of leaned over uh, the armrest, same time I'm going to get my gun out. Um, as I'm going to get my gun out, I know he's at, I realize he's advancing on me, still continuing to shoot uh, continuously. Uh, I'm able to get my gun out, and my gun had, I believe, three ret retentions. I don't remember doing any of those. I just remember thinking I have to get it out and then having it out. Um, I take it out, I put it out the window, and I automatically start firing back at him. As soon as I start firing back at him, he takes off running down the fence line and then disappears into the backyard. In this situation, the offender had an assault rifle with a clip with 30 rounds in it. He fired all 30 rounds at her, and she took six hits that night. 
Despite that, she was still able to return fire, and that's what saved her life, because the offender had another clip with 30 more rounds, and as he was approaching her, he was within about 10 feet. Another 30 rounds would have killed her that night. Every officer that we talked to described what I consider to be heroic um, measures of survival, yet not one of them will ever admit to being a hero. In their words, they were just doing their job. The officers talked about one of the reasons they, they believe they survived is training that they receive in will to survive. That means the fight is never over. Just because you get shot, you don't give up. You always return home that night. My friend, Officer Shannon Loudon, his wife is Susan's friend as well is one of the 200 police officers to be ambushed in this country every year. Shannon was one of the lucky ones. He survived. His injuries were very extensive and very miraculous in where the bullets went. His heart was contracting at the instant the bullet passed through. The surgeon said that had the heart not been contracting, the bullet would have hit it. The bullet also went through his diaphragm, so it was difficult for him to breathe, and it also went through his, his liver. It missed a major artery that's within the liver by millimeters. The surgeon said that if it would have hit that artery, it was inoperable. The only thing they could do is make Shannon comfortable for three days while he slowly bled to death, yet it missed it. I was going to have a great quote from one of the subjects in our study. Shannon was not in our study, but then Shannon s sent me this video that the WVU hospitals had done on his case, and he says it better than I could. You know, I had a lot of people question, are you going back to work? And, you know, I looked at it like, they got him kill me, and I'm not going to let him beat me in any way. And I felt like if I gave up and didn't go back to work and do what I love to do and, and fight to get back to where I was at, then I wouldn't be. And I wasn't going to let that happen. If I didn't go back to work, then the man who shot me beat me. And I wasn't going to let that happen. The research that we're doing with the FBI is um, wonderful research, but it's research that, like Suki's, makes a difference. Our next steps in this, we're in the process now of finishing up our data analysis, and we're starting to write the book that will be the next study published by the FBI. The people in Leoka are now taking these videos and our results and what we're finding, and they're turning those into the trainings that they'll offer for police officers nationwide. We're also beginning the development and planning of our next study, which be, will be a replication of the 2006 study, the felonious, the um, violent encounters. And so we've got more research to do, more lives to save, and thank you very much for coming today. Questions? <coughs> It's difficult. There's two types of profiling, and, and one of them was the one that was developed by the Behavioral Science Unit. That's kind of what I think everybody thinks about with, with um, behavioral profiling. And that's, that was developed with the work of serial killers. And that's trying to take a crime scene and from that extrapolate and say, what kind of a personality are we looking for? That's been fairly effective in narrowing down a potential pool of offenders. The other type is taking statistical data and saying, statistically, this person is most likely to do X, Y, or Z. Um, that's a lot more difficult, especially because if you're wrong on either end, if you're wrong on one side, somebody's life could end. If you're wrong on the other side, then you're violating somebody's human and civil rights by accusing them in advance of something that they had, had no intention of doing. So it's a really difficult, fine line. Um, and 
for the studies that we're doing, we don't have the data set to be able to do either one of those types of profilings. We can look for commonalities across these offenders, and we can look for commonalities across the officers' behaviors to see if there's anything perhaps that officers missed or something that maybe they did wrong that resulted in injuries. Good question. Yeah, so when I first made the decision to um, start studying violence prevention, um, we were driving home from Suki's funeral, and Susan and I were having a conversation, and I said, I really feel like I need to change my research. And so she said, well, what do you really want to know about? I grew up in Jefferson County, Colorado, and our football team always lost to Columbine. And this was shortly after the Columbine incident, um, a couple years beyond that. And I said, I guess I really want to understand why kids are shooting themselves in schools. And so I started reading in this area, and I found that there were very uh, well-funded groups that were already studying the shooters. The FBI, the Secret Service, the US Department of Education, all doing studies of this. But the missing piece was nobody was studying the near misses. These were incidents that were averted. Somebody intervened to prevent a shooting. Nobody was doing research in that area. And nobody was doing research in a related area, which is a school hostage standoff. So um, I started doing research in both of those areas. And we're, we were looking at um, school personnel who intervened to interrupt a plot. Um, the, the cases that we considered were all, um, there was enough evidence for a conviction. So these were not just kids issuing an idle threat. Um, and we came up with some commonalities across these cases in which they were averted that contrasted with what they were finding out about schools where there had been a shooting. And one of the things that we found is there were, within schools where there's been a shooting, there's something called the code of silence. So John might hear that I am troubled and may be planning something, but he doesn't say anything. He doesn't want to be a snitch. Or maybe I'm just boasting and talking big to try to get some status. So he doesn't say anything, and then I come in and I do a shooting. In over 75% of the school shootings, somebody else had known of the plans but didn't say anything. The schools where we went to, where they averted it, they had put in specific efforts and, and strategies to break that code of silence. Um, one principle that I talked to put it best, and he said, you have to have a culture within your school of dignity and respect. And when students feel like you respect them and you treat them with dignity, they will come to you and they'll talk to you about problems that either they're having or another friend of theirs is having. Um, and that, that came across both the schools that averted a shooting as well as schools in which uh, there was, had been a, a hostage standoff. Um, these were similar characteristics that we were seeing in those schools. Um, that work then led to a collaboration with the Behavioral Science Unit on, we called it, so, so not only do you have to have a nickname when you're in the FBI, but you have to have a really cool acronym. And so our acno acno acronym was Ghost Rap, the Global Hostage Taking Research and Analysis Project. And we were doing studies of um, people who were convicted of hostage taking and kidnapping. And we were doing the same type of methodology that we're using here to go into prisons and talk with people and try to find out what makes them tick beyond the obvious motives. And in that research, I've identified what I now call a micro motive. These are all of the little tiny events and markers within a person's life that lead them on a path to criminality. And as you've perused the uh, offender code book, each of those major points that's within there, and then there are subpoints under those. The major points are micromotives. They're the biopsychosocial factors that influence this person to go down that path. So that was the, the research that we've done on both sc averted school shootings and global hostage taking. So. Jeff, it, it seems 
seems like every day we hear a random kind of shooting incident, Kalamazoo, Michigan, and San Bernardino. Uh, it's a little different when it's outside of school, where you have a group situation. How well right. can you prevent that? You know that there's mental illness involved in a, at least a great many of them, maybe all of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no fail-safe way to prevent or predict. Um, threat assessment is an important piece. Oftentimes, people will give off markers before they're going to go on something like a shooting spree. Um, but you know, we look at what happened at Virginia Tech. The right people knew that this young man was very disturbed, but they didn't communicate, and. Um, things spiraled from there. And that was in the, the Virginia governor's report was that there was lack of communication between the police, the psychologist that saw him, or psychiatrist, people in the counseling center, and teachers. Um, they all believed that FERPA laws prevented them from talking to each other, but that's not true. Um, they were protected under FERPA laws to be able to speak with each other to try to get the right help for this person. Out in the public beyond a university or a school, I mean, um, you just have to hope that somebody will come forward with some information. Um, but uh, John Douglas, who was one of the original behavioral profilers for the FBI working um, serial killer cases, he made a statement in one of his books. He said, we can spend 40 to 60 to 80 hours a week trying to figure out how to stop these people but they are spending every minute of their waking life planning on how they can do what they do and get away with it. They're, until we can put the resources in that they are putting into how do I kill somebody and get away with it, we can't stop it. The best we can do is to try to minimize and then mitigate the effects of it afterwards. So not a positive, let's go home happy answer, but it's, I think, the reality of it. Yeah. Yeah, looking for looking for changes in behavior. Just like when our offender looked up, what is out of character for this student? And let's talk about it. Let's find out what's going on. Why has this behavior suddenly changed? <coughs> Um, one of the schools that I went to, uh, they talked about not being in their little cubicles, their, their classrooms or offices during movement times, and being out in the hallways, interacting, not just standing and watching, but going and talking with the students as they're going from class to class. One school that I went to that averted a shooting, the principal at lunchtime took me down and he said, let's go to the teacher's lounge. And we walked in and there were two teachers eating in there. He said, now let's go to the cafeteria. And there were round tables. At every single table with the students was one teacher. And he said, you would be amazed at the things these teachers learn when they can get to know the kids on that more personal level. So it sounds like your school is getting that, which is great to hear. Yeah, but that's just kind of the culture that that school has, has developed. So, are there other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for coming today, and um, it's, it's been a true honor for me to present to you today. I have business cards up here if anybody's interested, and I'm happy to visit with anybody who would like to visit.